going to give us an update. Uh, Yo, can you guys visiting. hear me? Yep, we've got you live and loud. What do you got for us, Herb? The following program, The Russ Belleville Show, is intended for responsible adults only. We advocate to the repeal of marijuana prohibition for adults. We discuss the science, culture, and controversy about America's marijuana laws. We do not advocate any illegal activity and encourage all listeners to learn their state and federal marijuana laws. Opinions and claims made by guests and advertisers on The Russ Belleville Show are their own and the Russ Belleville Show cannot be held legally responsible for their validity or reliability. Viewer discretion is advised. You take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you dry it, you roll it, you smoke it. You take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you dry it, you roll it, you smoke it. And it goes down smooth. Hey! Spanning the continent to bring you the truth about cannabis and marijuana law reform. I smoke pot and I like it a lot. Yeah! From the promise of legalization. Uh, and I think that we need to rethink and decriminalize uh, our, uh, our marijuana To the agony of prohibition. One major responsibility is to encourage people to use less drugs. The Rough Belleville Show, the voice of the marijuana nation. <laughs> Yeah, I hear you. You had a question for me. I... Now, here's your host, Radical Russ Belleville. All right, good day, Tokens and Tokens, and welcome. It is Monday, November 19th, 2012, and it's got to be 420 somewhere in the world. Welcome to the show, and uh, still a few things to clean up from the weekend, apparently, but uh, we will have a good show for you today, because our guest today is joining us for our Listen to Your Mother segment. Rebecca Forbes from North Carolina will be on the show talking about what it's like to be a mom in the South fighting for the end of marijuana prohibition. For our Behind the Headlines segment today, we are going to be taking a look at at some hypocrisy in the state of Colorado, where opponents of Amendment 64, who said it wasn't true legalization, are now selling Colorado first to legalize buttons. So uh, we'll talk about that. Also, we got time for a radical rant today. We're going to take a deep look in the Drug Free Workplace Act of 1988 and find out whether or not employers in Washington state really need to be doing drug testing. We've also got our Roots Monday Daily Toker Tune. Today we're going to be visiting with Dizzy Gillespie and doing some grooving high. Plus, we got all your headlines right here on the Russ Belleville Show. So stick around. We'll be right back after we take this break. And uh, don't forget to follow us on Twitter at Radical Russ. You can find us on Facebook at RB Show 420. And of course, our website is RadicalRuss.com. You can also send us emails here at the show at Russ at RadicalRuss.com. 
Also, good news for Wednesday. Make sure you tune in to our second hour, Toker Talk Radio. Normal founder Keith Stroff will be joining us, talking about his new book coming out, It's Normal to Smoke Pot, and his 40-year-plus crusade to end adult marijuana prohibition. How does he feel after seeing Washington and Colorado legalized? We'll find out on Wednesday. We'll be right back after these messages from our 420-friendly sponsors. Support these advertisers, because their ad money goes straight to the Russ Belleville Show. You're tuned into the Russ Belleville Show, the voice of the marijuana nation. It's simply business. It's simply business. It's simply business. You know why they won't let us grow. It's simply business. It's simply business. You know why they won't let us grow. It's simply business. The law offices of Omar Figueroa would like to remind you to stand up for your rights. Please do not give up your precious liberties. There's nothing wrong with standing up for our constitutional rights, and in fact, it's the only way to honor the Constitution that recognizes our natural rights. Treat law enforcement with respect and respect the Constitution by standing up for your rights. If you are detained or arrested, stand up for your rights by repeating, I respectfully invoke all my legal and constitutional rights. I do not consent to any search and seizure. I want to remain silent, and I want to speak to my attorney, Omar Figueroa. Omar Figueroa has more than a decade of experience in federal and California courts and graduated from Yale University, Stanford Law School, and Trial Lawyers College. Please contact the law offices of Omar Figueroa at 415-489-0420 or 707-829-0215 or on the web at www.omarfigueroa.com. I smell shit coming from over here and grilled onions from over there. Two of my favorite smells ever. Both those onions and that pot smell really good up here, you know. And now, a message from former President George W. Bush to remind the American people of our responsibility in our nation's war on certain American citizens using non-pharmaceutical, non-alcoholic, tobacco free drugs. One major responsibility is to encourage people to use less drugs. That's right, America, use less drugs. Now it's time for our 420 headline news. I'm Russ Belvelt. Marijuana legalization votes in Washington and Colorado are strengthening the hemp efforts in Kentucky. This is from the Louisville Morning Call. Efforts to legalize industrial hemp in Kentucky are getting help from votes in Washington and Colorado to legalize marijuana, according to Kentucky Agriculture Secretary James Comer. WFPLFM reports that law enforcement officials are opposed to legalizing hemp, saying that farmers would be able to hide marijuana in their fields. But Comer said law enforcement concerns are not valid because if hemp and marijuana are cross-pollinated, the marijuana would be ruined, according to the report. Comer, who is chairman of the state's hemp commission, said a new bill to legalize hemp will be presented to state lawmakers in 2013, according to the report. Bills that would decriminalize marijuana and approve its medical use may be headed for the Iowa legislature after voters in Colorado and Washington decided that adults should be allowed to possess small amounts of taxed and regulated pot for recreational use. Iowa State Representative Bruce Hunter, Democrat of Des Moines, is preparing a bill that would decriminalize pot possession as long as those caught with it weren't selling it, he told the Des Moines Register. Hunter also said he'll reintroduce a medical marijuana bill, and State Senator Joe Balcom said the newspaper told the newspaper he'll be seeking co-sponsors for his medical marijuana measure. Both measures likely will face tough opposition in the next session, which begins in January. Governor Terry Branstad has said he'll veto any bill that would legalize marijuana in any capacity. The Boulder County District Attorney's Office in Colorado will not be filing criminal charges against the recently passed Amendment 64 campaign after an opponent of the measure filed a complaint in October, reporting from the Boulder Daily Camera. 
Kathleen Chippai, a longtime marijuana activist from Nederland, filed the complaint on October 15th, alleging proponents of Am Amendment 64, which legalizes possession of up to an ounce of marijuana in Colorado, misrepresented the measure by saying it would treat marijuana, quote, like alcohol, end quote. Boulder County District Attorney Stan Garnett sent a letter to Chippai Thursday stating his office would not be pursuing criminal charges against the campaign. Garnett wrote that his office receives complaints against campaigns during every election, but that prosecution requires, quote, factually false statements, end quote, be made. He said that the charges against campaigns are rare. Garnett wrote, quote, one of the many benefits of our right to free speech under both the United States and the Colorado Constitutions is that citizens are at liberty to vigorously debate the pros and cons of legislative matters, constitutional amendments, and policy concerns. In all but the most egregious circumstances, they should be able to do so without the threat of criminal prosecution. 60% of Westerners favor legal marijuana. Only Southerners do not. The latest ABC News Washington Post poll confirms the results of marijuana elections in Washington and Colorado. A full 60% of those surveyed in the West support the legalization of marijuana, with only 37% opposed. Majorities of 54% and 52% support legalizing the possession of small amounts of marijuana for personal use in the Midwest and the Northeast, respectively. Only residents of the South still oppose marijuana legalization, with a 62% majority in opposition and only 36% in support. Among demographic groups, only conservatives, Republicans, seniors, Hispanics, and women oppose marijuana legalization. However, with the proper campaign, Hispanics and women will support marijuana legalization. The Atlantic profiled successful campaigns in Washington State and Colorado to legalize marijuana. Both campaigns targeted women in their advertising, taking pains to frame the initiatives as good public policy, not pro-marijuana. The results are clear. In both Colorado in 2006 and California in 2010, the gender gap in support predicted the failure of those legalization efforts. In this latest poll, men support legalization at 52%, but women oppose it by 53%. However, in Colorado and Washington in 2012 elections, 53% of women supported Amendment 64 and 53% of women supported Initiative 502. I'm Sub Cool from Team Green Avenger. At TGAgenetics.com, we are working on the leading edge of medical strains. Our strains are rigorously tested for THC, CBD, THCV, and other critical cannabinoids. Know your grow. Check out our genetic diversity at TGAgenetics.com. The home of Jelly Bean, Jack the Ripper, Vortex, and other award-winning cannabis strains. Warning. Hits taken on this show are larger than they appear. Do not try this at home. These people are professionals. They pay me to say that. What's to keep somebody from getting all potted up on weed and then getting behind the wheel? The Russ Belleville Show reminds you to never smoke and drive in pain. Hang out for a while. Share. Yes, we don't want anyone out there to get potted up on weed and get behind the wheel. Welcome back. It's the Russ Belleville Show, and we're going to take a moment here to get behind the headlines with something that uh, really, really upsets me. And this was when I saw you know one of our great listeners out there, one of our volunteers, Gray Wolf, uh, out in Colorado this weekend, uh, forwarded an email that he received from the Cannabis Therapy Institute. And uh, once I saw this email... I just knew that I was going to have to dig deeper into this and find more about it. And basically the story is this opponents of Colorado's legalization, the people who smoke pot themselves and benefit from state medical marijuana laws for years. Those folks, the ones who kept saying that it's not true legalization, it's not legalization. You know, the kind of people that sued because they dare said it would be regulated like alcohol. Those folks are now selling buttons, stickers, t 
t-shirts and other cafe press stuff under Colorado first to legalize. You can check out my blog at radicalrust.com or better yet, go to the Huffington Post's Denver section. It's uh, featured prominently there. But again, just like I predicted, some of the most vocal opponents of marijuana legalization that smoke pot as soon as the legalization passed, they'd be the first to jump on the bandwagon as soon as money could be made. I, I was just wrong about the state. <laughs> Colorado beat us, apparently, here. So if you go to their website, and this is where you can find the button if you're interested in you know, seeing the hypocrisy at work, uh, you'll find it at Legalize2012.com is the website, Legalize2012.com. And from there, you'll be able to sign, see the poorly made graphic. I mean, they didn't even bother you know, getting the sprites off of the edge of the pot leaf. But uh, you'll be able to see the graphic there for Colorado first to legalize and, and uh, that, that kind of thing. So um, uh, go ahead and look at that. Just don't buy anything from there, please. I uh, don't want to help support their efforts because you'll just be amazed at what some of the things are <laughs> that are going on with this. Uh, first of all, um, they've got uh, on their blog, I mean, where they're selling this first to legalize stuff, and you can also find it at uh, Colorado420.com and Denver420.com, which are all these websites that are registered by Laura Creho. And you'll find on these websites all of their stuff. They still have it up there when they were fighting against uh, Amendment 64. You'll see their Cannabis Policy Project blog with, what was it, like 9 or 10 or 11 different reasons to vote against Amendment 64, claiming that it's the marijuana regulation, not legalization and getting all upset that there would be marijuana enforcement cops. Oh, my God. Anyway, Laura Creho is this registrant behind Legalize2012.com, and they're offering these first-to-legalize buttons. And then they continue to explain how Amendment 64, this terrible Amendment 64, means that the good pot smokers, you know, people who follow the law, <laughs> would fund the police enforcement against the bad pot smokers. And those would be the people who don't follow the law. Those with more than one gram over an ounce or those with seven plants or those who do not wish to submit to state overregulation. So as upset as they are about Amendment 64, the funds raised by this first legalized merchandise will help fund a true grassroots campaign to fix Amendment 20. Yeah, that's right. Not Amendment 64. Not the one they got the problem with. They're going to fund fixing the medical Amendment 20 that they already had benefits under, not Amendment 64, the one that they're complaining about. In other words, the people who were already benefiting from the protections of the medical marijuana law, who then spent money to make sure healthy pot smokers would still be arrested, are now the hypocrites who are selling commemorations of the law they opposed that finally protects healthy pot smokers like me, in order to increase the medical protections only they were already benefiting from. Now, this Laura Creho manages Colorado420.com and Denver420.com as well, both heavily promoting the first to legalize merchandise. And they've got it right below a, he a heading, a, a banner, which, you know, trumpets their philosophy, which is legalize it like tomatoes. Legalize it. Like tomatoes, ignoring the fact that growing tomatoes in your backyard isn't likely to encourage teens to jump your fence and pick the vines clean in search of a high. And again, below the, the, the first to legalize graphic, another exhortation that Amendment 64 is not true legalization. So where's the Colorado first to regulate buttons then? Why aren't you selling Colorado first to pass untrue legalization the other sad part about this is that the sales of this merchandise will also probably help benefit miguel lopez and his legendary denver 420 legalization rally now that would be the same miguel lopez who went as far as forming a registered committee in opposition to passing amendment 64 now the name of this committee was the no on 64 take greed out of weed committee Right? Not take greed out of weed committee. He literally used the word outta. O-U-T-T-A. 
in an official government, you know, we're going to fight legalization committee. But the good news is, looking up the Colorado uh, Registry of Campaign Donations finds that the Take Greed Out of Weed Committee did not raise a single dime since 2011 in over two years of campaigning. Which kind of explains why Creho and Kathleen Chip Eye and Miguel Lopez and all these true believers always seem to fail to get their version of true legalization on the ballot and always seem to be the first ones in line to t- try to profit from the true legalization that happens from real legalizers in Colorado. Well, sir. Oh, you're unplugged. You're plugged into the other board. We'll have to fix that. But if, we're going to take a break and fix that and some other stuff in the song list. So uh, It's going around. after the hour. And we have to take a short break, if you know what I mean. Please support these sponsors who support Normal Show Live. Oh, have you ever met that funny repo man? A repo man. Have you ever met that funny repo man? A repo man. If he said he swam to China, he would say to South Carolina. Then you know you're talking to that repo man. Hi, this is Dan Michaels. If you're looking for professional voice talent for your commercial or podcast, I'm your man. Visit danmichaelsaudio.com for more information. Legalize me. Don't criticize. I'm just overjoyed. Uh, I've been cannabis activist for 40 years. We are turning the corner on a failed policy that's been disastrous for our communities, um, and things are going to get better. 80 years ago, we repealed alcohol prohibition in this state. We did it prior to the federal government, and we're doing the same thing when it comes to marijuana. We are uh, a step ahead, and we will continue to lead the way. It means I'm going to smoke a lot of weed tonight! Some call it marijuana. You're listening to Radical Russ on the Russ Belleville Show. Never mind, legalize Everyone knows music and marijuana go together, so let's wind up our 20 after break with the Russ Belleville Show's Daily Toker Tunes, the best in pod safe 420 music from around the web. Today is Roots Monday. Featuring the blues, country, folk, and jazz music that birthed the modern sounds we enjoy today. You can get downloads and more information about all our daily Toker tunes by visiting music.radicalrust.com. Now, sit back and enjoy your daily Toker tunes. All right, folks, as you can uh, probably discover from the webcam up there, we got a special, special song for today's Daily Toker Tunes on Roots Monday. And if you don't know, we have a show that we do every Monday night at uh, 8 p.m. Pacific time called the Viper Hour. And on the Viper Hour, we play this great reefer jazz music like what you're about to hear from the legendary Dizzy Gillespie. Now, Dizzy Gillespie uh, was had the great big cheeks like you can see there on the uh, on the picture. And a lot of people know him for that. And his trademark bent trumpet bell that he had all the way uh, bent at a 45 degree angle. And for a lot of people, that's the that's how they know Dizzy Gillespie. And uh, how that happened is an interesting story. Uh, it happened in 1953. Uh, Dizzy Gillespie uh, was playing a gig and someone backstage tripped and fell over his trumpet stand and accidentally bent the bell of his trumpet. And then he played it and he liked the sound so much that from that day forward he just continued to have all of his trumpets made that way (laughs) that's kind of interesting he's also one of the most influential figures uh of of jazz he revolutionized it in the 40s he became one of the inventors of the form called bebop and then championed in other uh other types of music into jazz like Afro-Cuban and Caribbean and Brazilian influences. So uh, a big turning point there in, in the 40s when he was playing. Uh, now, from his biography, interesting little quote here. When I came to New York in 1937, I didn't drink nor smoke marijuana. You got to be a square motherfucker, Charlie Shavers said, and turned me on to smoking pot. Now, certainly, we were not the only ones. Some of the older musicians had been smoking reefers for 40 and 50 years. Jazz musicians, the old ones and the young ones, almost all of them that I knew smoked pot. 
but I wouldn't call that drug abuse. Again, that's from the Dizzy Gillespie autobiography. A uh, big thanks to Cannabis Culture for the link. And uh, we are going to play this Dizzy Gillespie tune for you just as soon as I can pull it up. I'm having some programming difficulties today with the Liebermater, but we'll get this all fixed up for you and uh, turn you on to this great Dizzy Gillespie tune. Uh, appropriate song for today. It's called Groovin' High. <laughs> Cannabis sativa, the common name, marijuana. She has found a crutch to see her through her difficulties instead of facing up to them and coping with them. And in time, she may be ready to try something different, something better. Gateway theory doesn't work. It's a reality. Here are some of the answers we got to the question, if marijuana could talk, what would it say? Ow. Ow. Hey, you know the fire coming out of that lighter? It's fucking hot, dude. I told you, I ain't getting on no airplane. Your roommate pinches me when you're not around. <laughs> um, honey, does this baggie make my buds look fat? Well, look who scraped together $60. <laughs> A lot of people smoke pot. A lot of people smoke pot every day. Hey, a lot of people smoke pot and smoke pot every day, probably. <laughs> 
cannabis community includes a diverse set of activists and nonprofits working to end the prohibition of marijuana. We take the time to hear the stories of reform on the Russ Belleville Show's Cannabis Community Chat. Welcome back, everybody. And on the first and third Mondays of the month, we always have a segment here we call Listen to Your Mother. And a big help from the friends at Moms for Marijuana and other groups that are organized to uh, bring women out in support of marijuana legalization. Had a story earlier where I talked about the poll results on marijuana legalization. And we've always found that if women don't support legalization, it does not pass. So this is a very, very important segment. And one of the problems in getting women's support for marijuana legalization have to do with all the issues surrounding motherhood and family. So joining us today to talk about this issue, we have Rebecca Forbes, who's a mom in North Carolina. And Rebecca, welcome to the show. Hello, Rebecca. Are you there? Hmm. Having some problems with the uh, Skype connection here. Perhaps she's not hearing us on Skype. We will try to dial out and get her back on the line here. One moment. And while we do, we will uh, send to break here and give you just a little more comedy from the marijuana logs. Be right back. Hello. Hello. Can we speak with Rebecca, please? This is Rebecca. Hi, Rebecca. Russ Belville from the Russ Belville Show. Hey, uh, Russ Belville. How are you? Doing good. Sorry about that. Having a little trouble getting you on there. We didn't have our call screener for today, so uh, we're just kind of going blind, and we were hoping you were there, and we're glad to talk to you. Oh, glad to talk to you. So tell us how you got involved with marijuana activism. What makes you want to speak out on this issue? Okay. Um, you want me to start from the way beginning? Or sure, sure. From way beginning. In my early 20s, um, I met someone and learned how to grow um, cannabis. Um, we were together for about 13 years and had a child and um, in that process, I met a woman named Dean Marlowe from North Carolina, mm-hmm. and she was what uh, we call a cannabis patient, and um, that's when I learned about cannabis medicine, but I wasn't sick. Right. So back then, um, I was um, busted in 1998. Um, I had attended some rallies. In Melbourne, Florida, with LV Mystica, um, uh, we did the first ever North Carolina rally in 1995 um, here uh, ever, and Dean Marlowe sponsored that. So that's when my activism began. So around uh, around the mid 90s, late 90s. Yeah, mid 90s. Okay. Yeah. So um, in 1998, I was arrested for. Uh, maintaining a dwelling, uh, manufacturing nearly 400 marijuana plants, and possession with intent to sell and deliver mm-hmm. um, felony, mm-hmm. and sent to North Carolina prison for three years. Wow. Now, ha- ha- did you have children at this time? Uh, that you got Yes, sentenced? I had one daughter. Um, her and I are actually featured in the Exile Nation Project. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that. No, no. The tell- movie by Charles Shaw. Go ahead. Tell us about that. And the Tedworth Charitable Trust. Um, it's a online documentary of people affected by the drug war. And it has the story of my family featured in it, um, which was filmed in 2010. Do you have a, uh, is there a website for that? Do you know? Um, I think you just go to exilenation.org, I think, or you can find them on Facebook. Could you, what Type was in the Exile Nation Project. Do you say X? And like, you'll find it. Google say, it. Yeah, Google it. <laughs> are, are, you saying the letter X, it. are you saying the letter X like X-ray? No, E-X-I-L-E, the Exile ah, X- Nation Project. Exile Nation Project. Thank you. Yes, just having some it, was, it was aired in theaters across the country from Chicago to London. Um, I believe it aired, and you're in Oregon, I believe it aired up there somewhere. Um, but it's an, o- it's an ongoing documentary of drug war victims. Yes, exilenation.org is the uh, website, exilenation.org. And we'll put that in our chat room and through our Twitter so people can follow Yeah, that. it's an awesome site. Check them out. Um, 
There's 30 minute testimonies on everybody in that documentary um, that you can watch that tells more of their story. Because in the one hour documentary that was done, there's just bits and pieces of everybody's story. So it's a an, it's an awesome project. He patterned it after the Holocaust Chronicles. Okay. So it's a really cool project, something worth checking out. Okay, so this has got um, so since the mid nineties you get but, sentenced uh to like you said, three years. Tell yeah, us about that. In late ninety eight they took my child, they took my home, they took um my car, mm. all my money, and I ended up um over a process of two years waiting and doing everything they told me to do, ending up in prison for three years. So it was really about a five year process. Hmm. And this is all about growing marijuana plants. Busted. This is all about growing marijuana plants. Nothing, no other kind of crimes, no other nothing. No. Just it growing. Was three three marijuana charges. The only three charges on my record and the only time that I've been in trouble like that. Okay. In my life. So, um, and, it, and it did ruin my life. It ruined me having any type of a viable career. And I'm an educated woman. Um, I ended up starting my own construction business after getting out of prison and buying a horse farm. I'm a horse trainer. Um, I didn't belong in prison. It was the most horrible place I've ever been in my life. Um, I grew up on the coast of Falmouth. Uh, foresight in Maine mm -hmm. um, as a child and moved to the South with my father at the age of 16 and met the man that I was telling you that I met when I started growing marijuana when I was 21 years old. Mm. So my life in cannabis started at a young age, but we lived such a normal life. We were a normal family. We had chickens in the yard. We had pigs. We had a garden. Um, he worked a full-time job logging during the day. We were your typical country, normal North Carolina family. Mm -hmm. And um, they destroyed us. And after wow. I got out of prison, I completely stopped smoking cannabis or having anything to do with it for t nearly 10 years. I became the best soccer mom that you've ever seen on the planet taking nothing stronger than probably an ibuprofen if I had a headache and maybe having something to drink every now and then at a party. That's for 10 years. Mm. But over that time, um, I became very ill and started having cluster headaches and didn't know what was going on. And I'd be out with the horses and I was in the barn one afternoon and went to my knees with a pain that shot up in my head. So I knew that something health wise was going on and, uh, but didn't know what. So in late 2008, I got pregnant. Um, and I was in my forties, which was a shocker because I'd been with right. <laughs> somebody nearly 10 years and was raised, raising two kids at this point. Cause I have a son that's 10 years old. that's poking me in the back right now. Please stop. I'm on a radio show. But anyway, <laughs> Um, but anyway, um, which I've adopted, he, he came into my life with an ex of 10 years. We were together 10 years. So I got really sick and, and I lost a baby in 2008, got pregnant and lost it. And in that two weeks later, after I lost the baby, I went into severe pain and doubled over mm -hmm. here at the house. And my family took me to the emergency room, my daughter. And we found out that I had an adrenal mass and lung disease that night. They, the, the, uh, they did a CT scan of my abdominals because that's what was hurting. And that's what came back. And that was the cause of the miscarriage as well. Wow. So, um, so you your go adrenals from, affect you your go hormones. From some... They affect your heart rate. They affect your lung function. Um, some of your other organs, how they function and, and feed all your hormones and stuff. So they really mess with you. 
Right, right. So, so we're speaking with Rebecca Forbes. She's in North Carolina. She's a mom who's been affected by the war on marijuana, the, the drug war, the prohibition war. You begin as someone who's growing marijuana plants. You get caught. You do three years. You give it up for 10. And now you find yourself as a medical marijuana patient. And uh, being in North Carolina, uh, what are you trying to do now to, to, to stay out of jail again? Well, for the last three years, I've worked directly with the North Carolina legislature on two bills. Um, they all know who I am. They all know how I feel about this. They all know how sick I was. Um, with the adrenal tumor, I got up to over 200 pounds. I, I looked horrible. Um, I ended up in the what made me decide to take cannabis as an oil extract because that's what I've done for my illness. Um, I've taken the extract. I started out smoking it and got off of pain pills with the first tumor, the adrenal mass. Right. Um, and, and that was my first experience realizing, oh, my God, marijuana does have something medical about it because my side's not hurting as bad. Mm -hmm. And I don't have to take that Oxycontin over there. Mm -hmm. So that was my first realization that Gene Marlowe all those years ago <laughs> was telling the truth. Right. Right. Because I'd never experienced anything medical about marijuana. I was a recreational user in my 20s, and I was healthy as a horse, and I farmed and drove tractors and milked cows, and I'm a horsewoman. So <laughs> <laughs> healthy as, you know, healthy as a damn horse. Yeah, yeah. And isn't it odd that over 10 years of non-use is when I got sick well, and developed that... tumors? Yeah, yeah, good point. Now, uh, Rebecca, you, you're you a mom here, so how has... Oh, yeah, how, I've got how, a, a, how a big the... mom. How has all this effect, how how has all this drug war stuff affected your kids and your family? Well, my daughter Stephanie was taken um, in, back in the nineties. She was eight years old at the time, thrown into a foster home. Her story's in that movie, so I won't go through the whole details okay. of it. Um, but her testimony, as well as on the on the Exile Nation project and what happened to us, but she's grown up to be a healthy young woman now with my grandbaby, who also lived here. Good. So, yeah, and she's um, doing great. Um, she's had some relationship problems in life. Terrible PTSD of the police. Um, horrible. Mm -hmm. As well as her father, because he's been in and out of prison multiple times for mm -hmm. marijuana. Mm -hmm. um, and I've only been the once. Thank God I don't ever want to go back. Right. Um, well, you know, when we're trying to pass these laws for medical marijuana or for decriminalization or for legalization, one of the, you know, the opponents always come back. They'll say, what about the children? We always have trouble convincing what they call the soccer moms, you know, that, that this is a good idea. Mm -hmm. As somebody who, you know, you said you became that soccer mom. How would you talk to a soccer mom today and tell her that we need to end this prohibition? I would tell them. Because what, what I went through with law enforcement was so terrifying years ago that that is what made me stop using cannabis. Um, when I recreationally used cannabis as a mother and a family woman, I functioned, I worked, I took care of my kids, I grew gardens, I was fine. I smoked all the way through my pregnancy with my daughter, and she's a beautiful, healthy, wonderful young woman who was academically gifted in high school. Uh, they caught it when she was like 12 years old, was classified academically gifted. And I probably smoked about a quarter ounce of pot every day when I was pregnant with her. <laughs> um, I'm not kidding, because I was a grower. Sure, sure. And, you know, an illegal grower. Mm -hmm. So um, we just had it like that. You know, and another thing that really shocks me is all the news that these mainstream soccer moms see that they found this marijuana patch that's worth three million dollars. Bullshit. <laughs> Bullshit. We used to plant anywhere from four to six thousand plants a year, and the most we ever made was thirty-five thousand dollars. Right. Bullshit. Right. I hear you. And, you know, the other thing I'd like you to comment on, seeing as you've got some experience in this, you know, I hear the pot back in those days was only, you know, 3 4%. Oh, well, no, I would say it was a little better than that. Cause we, <laughs> we, we were kind of famous for ours, but, uh, you know, Cincy Bud and all that good stuff. But, 
But just this um, idea that that like like the, only the recent pot has been really powerful. I mean, that's that's what I'm, not true. Exactly. Um, when I was a teenager, I smoked. I started smoking marijuana when I was thirteen years old, and I was an AD honor roll student in school. I went to private Catholic school, um, so some of that bullshit too. What these soccer moms want to know? Um, if you're a motivated child, it doesn't matter. I I made it through high school. I didn't. I got in normal trouble like getting caught making cigarettes or some dumb stuff. And then my mom found my pot like 10 years after I left home and some cat that I left or something. You know, it's a really funny story because cannabis has just been ingrained in my life. Sounds like it. Um, oh, there's some funny stories I can tell you from when I was younger. <laughs> I, had, I had better leave than my dad. Let me just leave it at that. <laughs> okay. But anyway, <laughs> but anyway, no, that's not true. Because we had hash around back then. We had high stick. We had Panama Red. We mm-hmm. we were uh, doctors, lawyers, kids, and well, we had it like that. You know, I'm a fourth. I'm, I'm uh, I know the family name's on a magazine. But anyway, I, I did grow up in a very um, good neighborhood. But as kids, I mean, we had it like that. Yeah. That's Our that- parents had it. Well, it sounds like you turned... Mine didn't, but I, I knew some parents that did. Right. And the kids would get it, and we had it. And... Right. So as a, as, a, as a mom, then you're not afraid of, you know, these votes in Colorado or Washington that, are legal, that just legalized pot. A lot of the, you know, some of the parents there are saying, oh, no, now the use by kids is going to go up. That doesn't scare you? No. You know why? Because I have kids anywhere from a baby, that's a grandbaby, up to college age kids and I talk to my kids about drugs and that kind of stuff and I am dead up against pharmaceuticals and that K2 shit that they're selling in the convenience stores Mm -hmm. and this bath salt stuff that's being sold out here and stuff and I tell you what the laws we have against marijuana are what drive our children to do those substances because they don't get in trouble as much trouble for that Mm. If they're in college and they get caught with marijuana, then no more federal funding. If they get caught with pills or alcohol or something like that. And if, if, if soccer moms would really go look at the data, go look at how many children we've lost to, to uh, pharmaceutical overdose and alcohol. Mm-hmm. Yep. You're absolutely right. Very well put. I'll tell you, um, I'll tell you, that's all the time. If your child goes out and smokes it, goes, sneaks behind your back and goes and smokes the joint, they're going to still be alive. And they're probably going to come home and eat half the cereal box or something or like get in the fridge. That's a good way of knowing if your kid's smoking some weed. I know that. <laughs> Very well put. Well, Rebecca, that's all the time we got for our segment today. But uh, I want to thank you for joining us and for standing up for all those moms in the South that need to uh, hear this education. We appreciate your stories. I appreciate you, Russ. Thank we'll you for having me on. For these messages from our 420 friendly sponsors. Support these advertisers because their ad money goes straight to the Russ Belden Show. You're tuned into the Russ Belleville Show, the voice of the marijuana nation. Normal stands for responsible adult cannabis use. If cannabis use is causing problems in your life, consider taking a break or seeking medical assistance. Consider ceasing cannabis use if you have a family history of mental illness. Don't drive or operate heavy machinery while impaired by cannabis use. Cannabis use is not without risks, even though the risks may be far less than those posed by legal drugs. Hey, how's it going? My name's Will. I don't work at a used record store. I don't own an iguana, although I'm sure they make great pets. I don't have dreadlocks or play the acoustic guitar. I can remember quite well, thank you, and no, I don't constantly have the munchies. When 420 comes around, I've still got 40 minutes of work left. I've never hit a girl on a bike with my car or shot my friend with a shotgun. I've never had to apologize for letting a girl I was watching drown in a pool while I was getting high because, duh, I wouldn't be getting high if I was around children. I'm a regular guy who works regular jobs, just like the majority of all Americans who use marijuana occasionally and responsibly. My name is Will, and I'm normal. You want answers? I'm as mad as hell, and I'm not going to take this anymore! 
You want answers? You have offended my family. I think I'm entitled. You want answers? I want the truth! And you have offended a Shaolin temple. You can't handle the truth! Surely you can't be serious. I am serious. And don't call me Shirley. Hoorah! Radical plant. All right, folks. I... Uh... The passage of I-502 in Washington means marijuana becomes legal at midnight, December 6, 2012. But it doesn't provide any anti-discrimination protection for the people who partake in this legal activity. I just was reading a piece from the Seattle Times today that tells the city of Seattle, in addition to many other employers, is reminding its employees that the passage of I-502 does not change their workplace drug testing policy. Federal law still considers marijuana illegal, they explain, and they receive federal contracts, so they must maintain a drug-free workplace. Except, of course, for the caffeine in the break room, the acetaminophen and the antihistamines in the receptionist desks, the uh, Prozac and Adderall that the line workers may be prescribed, uh, the beer or the martini the boss has with lunch, and the nicotine being smoked by addicts on company time on company property. Those drugs are legal under both state and federal law. However, what most employers don't realize is that there is nothing about the 1988 Drug-Free Workplace Act that requires most of them to drug test by inspecting the urine or saliva or hair of their employees to maintain a facade of a drug-free workplace. In fact, the Department of Labor maintains a frequently asked questions page for organizations to help advise them on maintaining a drug-free workplace. The steps required are... Publish and give a policy statement to all covered employees informing them that the unlawful manufacture, distribution, dispensation, possession, or use of a controlled substance is prohibited in the covered workplace, and specifying that actions that will be taken against employees who violate the policy. Establish drug-free awareness programs to make employees aware of A. The dangers of drug abuse in the workplace. B. Policy of maintaining a drug-free workplace. C. Any available drug counseling, rehabilitation, and employee assistance programs, and D, the penalties that may be imposed upon employees for drug abuse violations. Notify employees that as a condition of employment on a federal contractor grant, the employee must A, abide by the terms of the policy statement, and B, notify the employer within five calendar days if he or she is convicted of a criminal drug violation in the workplace. Notify the contracting or granting agency within 10 days after receiving notice that a covered employee has been convicted of a criminal drug violation in the workplace. Impose a penalty on or require satisfactory participation in a drug abuse assistance or rehabilitation program by any employee who is convicted of a reportable workplace drug conviction and make an ongoing good-faith effort to maintain a drug-free workplace by meeting the requirements of this act. Hmm, okay, so publish a policy statement, educate on the dangers of drugs, punish drug violations in the workplace leading to convictions, require employee rehab, but not a word anywhere in there about requiring employees to pee in a cup. Now, there are certain occupations that are covered by federal law, that do require adherence to drug testing. They include Department of Transportation, the FAA, you know, airline industry, pilots and such, FTA, Transit Authority, that's, you know, buses and such, RSPA, the pipelines, right, pipeline workers are federally covered, have to, have to pee test, FRA, the Federal Railroad Administration, you know, train conductors, U.S. Coast Guard and Merchant Marine, they have to have to drug test, and federal motor carriers with a vehicle of a gross weight of 26,001 pounds or more, or a vehicle which is designed to carry 16 or more passengers, including the driver, or a vehicle of any size and weight that has been used to transport hazardous materials. And also, contractors for the Department of Defense are required to implement random drug testing. Uh, if you're not sure, you can go to the federal Am I Covered page at the Department of Transportation. I've provided a link for you at RadicalRust.com. But if you're not in one of those industries, one of those federal Department of Transportation or covered by a Department of Defense contract, 
then you're not required to make employees pee in a cup. You're only required to maintain a drug-free workplace, and the definitions of which basically say you can't use drugs in the workplace, you can't sell drugs in the workplace, you can't store drugs in the workplace. doesn't say a damn thing about smoking a legal joint on a Saturday night. Now, that's the federal law. Let's take a look at Washington state law, because under Washington state law, and again, I'm no lawyer, but to the best of my research, and I looked pretty hard, employers are under no requirement to drug test their employees. Now, I did find in previous Washington Revised Code that the state had offered a 5% discount on their mandatory state workers' compensation insurance premiums uh, for workplaces that did do drug testing. But when I looked in the current state guide to workers' compensation, I could find no mention of that whatsoever and no mention of drug testing whatsoever. Now, as marijuana use on December 6th will be as legal as alcohol use, Washington state employers would be wise to revise their drug testing policies to just exclude marijuana use. You know, you still test for all the other illegal drugs, I suppose, if you think that means anything. Now, Dan Swedlow was quoted in the Seattle Times. He's a, he's a senior staff attorney for the Teamsters Local 117. It's got like 16,000 unionized members. He said, quote, we think 502 changes everything. We're clearly headed for a showdown with some employers. Once it's legal, there's just not a legitimate interest for an employer to say, you tested positive, you're fired, end quote. However, the defenders of the status quo disagree. James M. Shore is an employment lawyer, and he told the Seattle Times that he just recommends that companies change their policies to prohibit drugs that are illegal under state or federal law, quote, with an exclamation point on federal law, <laughs> end quote. And he also suggests that they maintain a zero tolerance policy on any detected amount of marijuana metabolite. <laughs> now, this puts employers in the position of enforcing the federal ban against marijuana, which is something that 56% of the people of Washington State just rejected. And even the U.S. Department of Labor admits, quote, drug testing does not test for impairment or whether a person's behavior is or was impacted by drugs, end quote. Furthermore, according to the U.S. Department of Labor, quote, most private employers have a fair amount of latitude in implementing drug testing as they see fit for their organization, and private employers are not required to follow these mandatory guidelines for federal workplace drug testing, end quote. Now, no matter what employers do, the marketplace is going to force their hand. Employers are going to have an increasingly difficult time finding qualified employees as legal use of marijuana leads to more failed pre-employment screenings. Companies that respect their employees' legal marijuana use will have a leg up on the best talent in labor. And as months of legal marijuana progresses and there's really no appreciable change in workplace safety and productivity, the remaining drug testers will only have, well, Uncle Sam said so as a defense for their retrograde discriminatory policies against marijuana consumers. A state eager for tax revenues, in the meantime, will be forced to confront employers' policies that limit the state's potential tax revenue by forcing Washingtonians to choose between keeping jobs and legal taxed marijuana purchases. Oh, and by the way, they're going to try to tell you, and, and this is in one of their, you know, the antis, these drug testing people's websites, that, quote, Drug abuse creates significant safety and health standards and can result in decreased productivity, end quote. Well, in the case of marijuana, it's bunk, people. Workplaces are the safest they have ever been in nearly every medical marijuana state, and marijuana is only a health hazard if a 300-pound bale of it falls on you from the sky. <laughs> uh. Almost every study claiming these harms lumps marijuana in with other drugs. And when they measure the productivity, they measure the lifetime earnings of marijuana users compared to non-users, which completely ignores the fact that drug testing prevents marijuana users from achieving higher career status. And marijuana also, you know, sometimes leads to incarceration.
Look, I've been writing for seven years the legalization of marijuana under any circumstances in just one state would be like toppling the first domino in a line. As someone who's writing about marijuana for seven years because drug testing derailed my career, I couldn't be happier to watch these pee-testing dominoes fall. And that's all the time we got today. For Brian the Red, I'm Radical Russ. Thanks for joining us here. Stay tuned for Hour 2. We'll take your calls at 971-533-7111. And until next time, take care of each other, tokers. This is the Russ Belleville Show. The Russ Belleville Show is blogging and podcasting daily at RadicalRuss.com. You take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you try it, you own it, you smoke it. You take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you try it, you own it, you smoke it. You take a seed, you plant it.